Many people around the world live in small towns where everyone knows your name. Speak for yourself, small town boy. I'm a big city guy. <laughs> uh, well, let's pretend and talk about a really weird, sad town in Pennsylvania. Fire up Google Maps, ladies and gentlemen. We're headed to Centralia. Centralia is a town in eastern Pennsylvania that had about a thousand residents in 1980. But as of the 2010 census, only 10 remain. The Commonwealth of Pennsylvania seized the land on which the town sits via eminent domain back in 1992. A decade later, the United States Postal Service discontinued the area zip code. No mail for you. Uh, in October 2013, officials said they would allow the seven remaining residents to live out their lives there, after which the rights of their houses would be taken through eminent domain. Eminent domain is also known as compulsory purchase in other parts of the world. This is the power that a state or government has to take private property for public use, with the owner receiving just compensation for it. This all sounds really sad so far. It is pretty sad. So why don't we try going back in time a little bit and see if that makes things better? Okay. So much of the land in Columbia County, which is where Centralia sits, was sold by several Native American tribes to colonists in 1790 for a sum of 500 pounds. In 1793, Robert Morris, a hero of the Revolutionary War and a signatory of the Declaration of Independence, acquired a large parcel of land in the area. He declared bankruptcy five years later, and the land rights went to the First Bank of the United States, which sold it to a French sea captain by the name of Stéphane Girard. By this point, it was known that coal was located underground throughout the area. In 1841, the town that would become Centralia was settled. A year later, it was sold again, this time to the Locust Mountain Coal and Iron Company, which erected streets and housing developments. So I had hoped that a history lesson would bring something more jovial to the episode, a little bit of jolly. But, like, seriously, who names their company after locusts? (laughs) It's so bad. (laughs) It gets more depressing, though. The first two mines in Centralia opened in 1856, the Locust Run Mine and the Coal Ridge Mine. These were followed by three additional mines, all opened by 1863. Centralia was incorporated as a borough in 1866. Two years later, its founder, Alexander Ray, was murdered by members of the Molly Maguires. This was a secret society active in Ireland, Liverpool, and parts of the eastern United States, best known for their activism among Irish-American and Irish-immigrant coal miners in Pennsylvania. Oh dear. Members of the group would commit several more murders and incidents of arson during the 1860 and early 1870s until their leaders were hanged in 1877. The town of Centralia came to its maximum population of 2,761 people in the year 1890. At its peak, the town had seven churches, five hotels, 27 saloons. Mine in town. <laughs> two theaters, a bank, a post office, and 14 general grocery stores. It's like one saloon for every 100 people. <laughs> it's, it's pretty good. <laughs> By the 1920s, coal mining in the region had peaked, and then the stock market crash in 1929 led to the closure of many of the mines. Now, bootleg miners were still continuing their operations in several abandoned areas, using techniques that included what was called pillar robbing. This sounds horrifying. Mm. Miners would extract coal from pillars left in mines to support their roofs. As you might imagine, this often caused collapses. Coal mining in the area continued up until the 1960s when the mine fires started. But more on that in a minute. Thanks to FreshBooks for supporting this week's show. Whether you have hundreds of clients to invoice each month or just attend residents of Centralia, FreshBooks is for you. Their platform is built to work the way you do and really helps empower those of us who work online to get invoicing done quickly. Every time you log into FreshBooks, you see what needs your attention. And you'll be in and out in minutes when you need to get those invoices sent because they make it so easy for you to create and send them and also make it easy for your clients to pay you as well. Find out more and try out FreshBooks for 30 days by going to freshbooks.com slash ungenius. Thanks to FreshBooks for their support. On May 7th, 1962, the Centralia Council met to discuss the approaching Memorial Day and how the town would go about cleaning up the Centralia landfill, which had been opened just a year earlier. The landfill had been created in an old strip mine. The 300-foot-wide, 75-foot-long pit was roughly 50 feet deep and had been cleared back in 1935. 
Pennsylvania had passed a precautionary law in 1956 to regulate landfill use in strip mines as landfills were known to cause destructive mine fires. This law required a permit and regular inspection for a municipality to use such a pit. However, the town council opted to have the trash burned, ignoring the warnings put forth by the state. On May 27, 1962, five members of the volunteer firefighter company were hired to burn the trash, then extinguish the pit. Didn't go very well. Flames were seen two days after the fire had supposedly been put out, and again a week later. A bulldozer was used to stir up the garbage so firemen could douse concealed layers of the burning waste. A few days later, a hole as wide as 15 feet and several feet high was found at the base of the north wall of the pit. The hole was caused by another mine having been cut underneath the pit decades before. It provided the fire a pathway to the miles and miles of twisting mines underneath the town. Fed on exposed coal veins, this fire had more than enough fuel to spread. The town notified the Lee Valley Coal Company that a fire had started in the mine, but they left out the part about having intentionally set it. It was expected that the state would pay to dig out the fire, uh, which would prove to be very expensive. An offer from a local miner to put out the fire in exchange for the rights to any coal he found was turned down after state inspectors measured lethal levels of carbon monoxide in the mines, shutting down all legal mining activity in the area. Now, after this, three main attempts were made to extinguish the fires. The first took place in August of 1962, so it had already been burning for several months. Engineers from the Department of Mines and Mineral Industries drew a map around where they believed the small fire to be. They hired a contractor, uh, Bridie Incorporated, but they were forbidden to do anything to confirm the size of the fire that the map had provided. Digging took place until October 29th when the allotted $20,000 budget had been spent. This initial effort was unsuccessful as the fire was larger and deeper than had been believed. As such, Britty was digging into areas with active fires just to have them grow when exposed to oxygen from above the ground. In November, K&H Excavating was hired to pump a mix of water and crushed rock into shafts dug around the perimeter of the dump. Below average temperatures, however, caused progress to be slow as the water kept freezing and the openings were never completely filled. By March, the effort had been abandoned. Just a month later, in now April of 1963, the mine fire had spread eastward as far as 700 feet, which is 210 meters, from its original starting place, and the steam began issuing from additional holes in the ground. This was just the beginning of the end of the town of Centralia, and yes, at this point, the fire had been going on for almost a year, but you just wait. By the 1970s, the fire was causing real issues in the town. Gas station owner John Coddington inserted a dipstick into one of his underground tanks to check the fuel level, but it came out hot. He lowered a thermometer on a string and was shocked to discover the temperature of the gasoline in the tank was 172 Fahrenheit, 77.8 degrees Celsius. I'm sure that's fine. I I reckon that big (laughs) tanks of gasoline can be at that temperature. It's no problem. It's no problem. Totally fine. Mm-hmm. Starting in 1980, citizens were complaining of numerous health issues caused by the carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide putting off by the fire. In 1981, yes, in case you're following, that's nearly 20 years since the fire started burning, a 12-year-old resident named Todd Domboski fell into a sinkhole four feet wide and 150 feet deep that suddenly opened beneath his feet in a backyard. Jeez. He clung to a tree root like an action hero until his cousin, 14-year-old Eric Wolfgang, saved his life by pulling him out of the hole. The plume of hot steam billowing from the hole was measured as containing a lethal level of carbon monoxide. Like, incredibly lucky to survive that. In 1984, Congress allocated more than $42 million for relocation efforts. Most of the residents of the town accepted buyout offers and moved to the nearby communities of Mount Carmel and Ashland. But as we mentioned, in 1992, Pennsylvania Governor Bob Casey invoked eminent domain on all property in the borough, condemning all of the buildings within. A subsequent legal effort by residents to overturn the action failed. In 1996, the fire claimed the nearby town of Burnsville, it's an unfortunate name, when the last house standing there was torn down. The highway serving the area, Pennsylvania Route 61, was rerouted around the old town as the land underneath the highway had been damaged by the fire. 
On the Wikipedia page for Route 61, you can see photos of the old damaged stretches of highway with steam coming up from the ground. It's unreal, man. It's unreal. Today, Centralia basically looks like a field with old abandoned roads going through it. Just a handful of buildings remain. In May of 2009, the remaining residents mounted another legal effort to reverse the 1992 eminent domain claim. The 2010 census numbers that we read have been widely publicized. There were 10 people present for the census, down from 21 just a decade before. There were three families and no children under the age of 18. The median age was 62 and a half years old. In March of 2011, only five homes remained when a federal judge refused to issue an injunction that would have stopped the condemnation of what was left of the town. However, in February 2012, the Commonwealth Court allowed residents to stay in place after evidence that the fire had moved on was presented. This led to a notable increase in air quality, which is good. (laughs) In October 2013, the remaining residents settled their lawsuit, receiving $218,000 in compensation for the value of their homes, along with $131,500 to settle additional claims and the right to stay in their homes for the rest of their lives if they so chose. I love this. The borough council still has regular meetings as of 2011. It was reported that the town's highest bill came from the power utility at $92. Citizens proudly say the town's budget was, quote, in the black. (laughs) Uh, This reminds me of Sealand a little bit now. A little bit, yeah. The only indications of the fire, which underlies some 400 acres, which is 1.62 square kilometers, spreading along four fronts, a low round metal steam vents in the south of the borough, and several signs warning of underground fire, unstable ground, and carbon monoxide. It continues to burn and may do so for another 250 years. Yes, 250 years. The fact that these mines are coal mines are the reason that this continues. There's ample fuel and a lot of space, and nobody to stop it. So it just keeps on trucking. Now, this town pops up in interviews and media features every couple of years. It was even used as the basis of the Silent Hill video games and subsequent film. I did not know that. The 2007 documentary, The Town That Was, is about the history of the town and its current and former residents. It has also been on the Travel Channel and WMYC's Radio Lab. So I think this town and you know the other towns like it, we mentioned Burnsville, there have been others, really highlight the danger of coal mining and you know these mines and, and all this stuff were done well before regulation that was put in place and even in 1962 right the town like this started because the town didn't follow the law and then lied to the state about it so it's it's sad but i think it's a good reminder of like progress that hopefully has been made i mean of course it's really sad about the people that are made to leave and and for the damage and stuff but there is kind of something a little poetically beautiful about a fire that just cannot be put out like a 250 year fire under the ground is kind of an incredible thing it burns forever like my love for you mike thank you so much let's wrap it up if you want to find show notes this week including the picture of the burning highway which is super creepy uh you can find all that stuff at relay.fm slash ungenius slash 18 there you can get in touch you can send us an email you can reach out on Twitter. The show is at Ungenius. Mike is there as I-M-Y-K-E, and you can find me there as I-S-M-H. And until our next weird article, Mike, say goodbye. Goodbye. Adios.